This micro lecture is on basic energy economics. Please take a moment to review this week's learning objectives. Spare capacity is the volume of production that can be brought on within 30 days and sustained for at least 90 days. Major oil supplying countries such as Saudi Arabia have been keeping 1.5 to 2 million barrels per day of spare capacity for adequate response to market volatility. From 2003 to 2008, low spare capacity drove the oil price very high. Oil prices, regardless of where the oil was produced from, tend to move together globally. It is a linked market. A hundred years ago, this may not have been the case, but today, globalism has linked us all. Nothing happens in the global fuel economy without having rippling effects on something else. Geopolitical events affect oil prices, particularly wars. Number one on the figure was when U.S. spare capacity was exhausted. Number two was the Arab oil embargo. Number three was the Iranian Revolution. Number four was the Iran-Iraq War. Number five was when the Saudis abandoned their swing producer role. Number six was when Iraq invaded Kuwait. Number seven was the Asian financial crisis. Number eight was when OPEC cut production targets by nearly two million barrels per day. Number nine were the terrorist attacks on 9-11. Number 10 was another case of low spare capacity. Number 11 was the 2008 global financial collapse. And number 12 was when OPEC cut production targets by about four million barrels per day. Like most of us know, oil prices and gas prices are pretty closely linked. So when oil goes up, gas goes up, and vice versa. This is not ever a direct relationship because of reserves that build up downstream and upstream of refineries. But from a zoomed-out monthly perspective, it's pretty close. Electricity is often regarded as a clean power source due to its low emissions when used by you and me. The generation of electricity, however, often involves the use of large amounts of fossil fuels and incurs significant amount of carbon dioxide emissions. Over 50% of the electricity generated in the U.S. comes from power stations fueled by coal and natural gas. As a result, electricity generation is responsible for around 32% of the greenhouse gas emissions in 2012. Notice how petroleum is not on this graph. Domestic oil production, oil prices, and biofuels have very little direct effect on coal prices and utilization of coal for energy. The largest threat to coal as an energy source comes from natural gas because of its low price and the relative simplicity of natural gas turbines compared to coal power plants. If we want to get off coal, the solution has nothing to do with oil production. If we want to reduce power costs, the solution has nothing to do with the price of oil. It has everything to do with coal and natural gas. This map makes some important points about where the energy comes from for different states, and there are good reasons for this distribution. Notice how pretty much only the Pacific Northwest has a lot of hydro. Also notice where the nuclear power plants are and consider population densities as well as emissions considerations. Finally, notice how the entire center of the country is mostly coal, but a lot of the coastal areas in the northeast are mostly gas. Coal is so common because it is so cheap, but it takes up a lot of space and we use it in a fairly dirty way. Gas, on the other hand, is present in places that have large oil reserves and also places that are capable of receiving imported liquefied natural gas. Gas is often a more popular energy source in places with high population density and high land prices because it is much simpler to use than coal, and gas turbines can be placed in something as small as a house. Fossil fuels play important roles in electricity generation. Therefore, the price of electricity is closely linked to the fuels from which the electricity is generated. The divergence that is starting to happen in 2011 in the graph is due to natural gas, 
but the price of coal is also starting to rapidly drop, which will change availability since it is already produced at fairly minimal profit margins. Energy futures trading is a very common zero-sum game. The speculative community flocked to the energy market after 2000. Crude oil futures and gasoline futures are traded at the New York Mercantile Exchange and the Tokyo Commodity Exchange. Ethanol futures are traded at the Chicago Board of Trade. Notice what speculation did to the price of oil around the time of the recession in 2008. During that period, speculation led to a massive increase in the value of oil, pushing the price of a barrel up to around $140. This stood in stark contrast to the internal value of oil in most large oil companies, which is more on the order of $30 to $40 a barrel. If an oil company can't make money on an oil field at $30 to $40 a barrel, they probably won't develop the resource. So you can imagine how thrilled oil companies were and how great the profits became when fuel traders and speculation drove the price of oil to $140 a barrel. Fuel smuggling and stealing is an aspect of fuel economics not often discussed. These kinds of price differences shown in the image support gasoline smuggling at the cost of the country with the higher prices. Not all fuel economics is handled in the boardroom or the trading floor or the government. In some cases, the economics are based on smuggling and stealing. In places where fuel is highly valued but not easily available, fuel can be acquired by more than just legal means. Even though we are globalized, national laws are relative to the country, and this absolutely affects supply and demand economics. Please take a moment to read and understand this image depicting the cradle-to-cradle -cradle cycle. It will help in the upcoming lectures.